All right, everybody, the president is coming out. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'd like to begin by saying that we're continuing to negotiate with the Democrats to get our great workers and small businesses all over the country taken care of. I think we, uh, we're getting close to a deal. Could happen. Could happen. A lot of good work has been going on, and uh, we could have an answer tomorrow. And we're going to see what, uh, what exactly does take place. We're also looking at helping our hospitals and our rural hospitals who have been hurt very badly. The rural hospitals for a long time have not been treated properly. We're looking to help them and beyond. So we're looking at hospitals also as part of the package. And we'll see how that all comes out. But uh, a lot of good things are happening. Some very good negotiations. I uh, just got off the phone with the Secretary of the Treasury. And we have some very good negotiations going on right now. And uh, I think you could have a nice answer tomorrow, but we'll see. America continues to make steady progress in our war against the virus. As of today, we've tested 4.18 million Americans. That's a record anywhere in the world. The United States has now conducted more total tests than all of the following nations combined. France, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, India, Austria, Australia, Sweden, and Canada. And our testing is expanding very rapidly by millions and millions of people. Good. So we've, uh, we've done more testing than all of these countries combined. France, United Kingdom, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, India, Austria, and Australia, Sweden, and Canada. That's something, right? We're doing a great job. We're — we are — this team is an incredible team. And that includes Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of our military people, our admirals, our generals. Got a, one of our great admirals here has done an incredible job. You haven't slept too much in the last two months either. Look at him. <laughs> but uh, somebody said to me, President, you look tired. I said, I should be tired. We should all be tired, but we have to win, right? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, the President — the Vice President will lead a call with our nation's governors from FEMA headquarters, Mike, yes, to review what more they could do and do together to develop locally tailored testing strategies, working very hard with governors now on testing. We want to help them out. Before the call, we'll send them a full list of all of the large laboratory machines in the States. They have a lot of machinery in the States that some aren't that aware of, but they, they're there, and they're really high-quality machines, by the way and the potential capacity of those machines if they're fully utilized. A couple of them didn't know that they could be utilized in a different manner. They're only up to 10 percent, and they can go 90 percent more. Many governors are still relying on their state laboratories rather than the full and much larger capacity that is available to them. As an example, commercial laboratories such as Quest and LabCorp, these are massive laboratories that can handle a lot more than they're being sent. Uh, a few days ago, it was at 30 percent. They're only at 30 percent capacity now. I don't know. They're probably the same, but they have a lot of capacity. In addition, academic laboratories, big research labs, uh, there's tremendous capacity out there. And some of them want the fast, uh, you know, the instant uh, uh, Abbott machine, which just came about due, due to the research during this little short period of time, and it's very quick. But uh, these labs can do it very quickly also, and they're, they're massive. They can handle much more, much more than the machine, the small machine, can handle. We continue to procure millions of swabs, test collectors. I have something here. Just happen to have a, It's a swab. Looks innocent. Not very complicated. I'm not sure why the President needs that himself, but I, I mean, it's a nice prop. It shows. Continue, Mr. President. Anybody like to see what it looks like? Should I open it? Does open everybody? It yes, open it up. I will. I will. The, the president is doing an unboxing this of a swamp. This is what it's about. Right? Is it, uh, does it remind you of something? It reminds you of this, right? One's a swab, one's a Q-tip. It's actually... The president is now showing the difference between a Q-tip and a medical swab. Continue, sir. Different. It's very sophisticated, actually.
but it's a little bit like, so this is the swamp. And uh, we've ordered a lot of them. They have a lot of them. Some of them, uh, some of the states, uh, they were shipped to states, and the states don't know where they are. And uh, But that's, that's it. Why don't we give this to uh, Karen? Perhaps she'll take an extra test. <laughs> right? But this is a big deal. And uh, we're working on it, and we're working with the companies. And uh, I think in the end, we're going to have we're going to have a we're going to have a tremendous uh, a tremendous success. No, nobody is close to us. No country is close to us. In fact, and I appreciate it very much. The Wall Street Journal wrote a fantastic piece. A highly respected gentleman, Christopher Demuth, and uh, this piece was just in the Wall Street Journal. Weekend edition, and Trump rewrites the book on emergencies. That's what's happened too. And we uh, just read one paragraph. Uh, he's given pride of place to federalism and private enterprise, lauding the patriotism and proficiency of our fantastic governors and mayors. Meaning, I do call them fantastic when it's appropriate. And our incredible business leaders and genius companies, I guess I probably use those terms, too, when they're doing a good job. When they're not doing a good job, I don't use those terms. Our heroic doctors and nurses and orderlies and our tremendous truckers, they have all done good jobs. By shouting out many of them by name and documenting their deeds on a fully daily basis, he has vivified the American way in action. Once it was reluctantly aroused. It was hard to get it aroused, and it is hard to get it aroused, but we got it aroused. When asked why he has not issued orders for nationwide home and business lockdowns, he has emphasized that the intensity of the epidemic varies widely and is best met by calibrated state and local judgments. That's the judgments of governors and local people. That, that is true. Much of this has been left up to the governors themselves. Uh, the president, while he does not have total power, he does have extreme power uh, among many of these things. Um, a lot of it has been left up to the governors, and I mean, that's how it should be, because we are these United States of America. Continue, sir. And added pointedly that such steps would conflict with the Constitution. But very importantly, he's, he's just a very respected gentleman. To see this was a very nice feeling. Not for me, necessarily, but for all of the people that have worked with us. I mean, they've, they've worked so hard, and we've developed tests that are so fantastic. We've, we've uh, come up with things that nobody had ever heard of. And we did it during, during this pandemic. We did it under pressure. It's called reaction under pressure. It's pretty amazing what our people have done. And that includes all of our military people and our uh, CDC, uh, just about everybody you can imagine, including Tony and Deborah, and they work long hours. There's nobody that's uh, getting a lot of sleep. We're close to finalizing. I want to thank the writer of Christopher for this article, and it's a great article. That was, frankly, the least of it. What I read, it was a great article. We appreciate it. We're close to finalizing a second partnership through which a U.S. manufacturer would convert its existing plant to produce over 10 million additional swabs per month. And we should be ready to announce this in a very short period of time. Uh, we also uh, are going to be using, and we're preparing to use, the Defense Production Act to increase swab production in one U.S. facility by over 20 million additional swabs per month. Uh, we've uh, had a little difficulty with one, so we're going to call in, as we have in the past, as you know. We're calling in the Defense Production Act, and we'll be getting swabs very easily. Swabs are easy. Ventilators are hard. Ventilators are a big deal, and we are now the king of ventilators. We have so many ventilators. You know, I said nobody that needed a ventilator has been turned down. It's pretty amazing. Nobody. We, we have to stress the absolute manufacturing capability that these United States have. When push comes to shove, we can crank it out like nobody's business. Continue, sir. 
Uh, we're working with the world-class team at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to use its injection molding capacity to potentially produce over 10 million collection tubes per week. That's tremendous numbers. In the meantime, the Supply Chain and Logistics Task Force continues to surge testing and needed supplies all throughout America. Uh, Mike's team and the task force, they just met. They've been meeting virtually every day. And uh, it's a great team, right? It's a great team. They've been uh, doing a great job, Mike. You've been doing a great job. Many governors are doing this incredible work, and they're working with us very closely on testing and working in their states. And again, it should be a local thing because it's point. It's all these points within a state. Um, but we're helping them a lot, and we want to help them a lot. We're going to help them more than a lot, actually, if you think about it, with what we've done. Think of it, we've done more than all those countries combined. We're encouraging them to share their successful strategies with other governors. Some of the governors are doing a better job than others. The robust capacity that we've brought online will empower governors to deploy sophisticated strategies so they can safely reopen their states. Uh, some people believe in testing very strongly, and other people believe in it less strongly, but still, it's a very good thing to have. I think we can say that. Some people believe in it like they can't exist without testing, and other people don't believe in it nearly as much. Uh, they can see how they're doing, and they feel how they're doing. And they've been pretty vocal about that. I think you know pretty much who I'm talking about. But I believe if they want it, we should give it to them and get it, get it for them and work with them. You must remember that the governors wanted to have total control over the opening of their states, but now they want to have us, the federal government, uh, do the testing. And again, testing is, is local. You can't have it both ways. Testing is a local thing. And it's very important. It's great, but it's a local thing. And uh, we're going to get we're going to get it done uh, to a level in a very short period of time because all of these, all of the swabs are coming in, all of the necessary materials, a lot of them, as I said, are already there, but a lot of people don't know that yet. Uh, but we'll, well, if they don't know it's there, that sounds like a problem. It sounds like a breakdown in communication. Why, why don't people know? I'm, I'm curious about that. So continue. We'll be doing uh, testing at a level. Already, we're doing testing at a level nobody's ever done before, but we'll be doing testing at a level that the biggest tester in the world will be very happy very soon. And it is. It's very much like ventilators. Uh, you don't hear the word mentioned, and that's much tougher, much tougher. When you have to build these machines, we built thousands of machines. We'll more than uh, help the governors, and we'll make sure that uh, everything goes well, just like it did with Ventilators, just frankly, like it did with face masks, so on a much easier subject. As face masks, again, everything's easier than a ventilator. Ventilators are tough. But w w well, again, even if we have them, we need to get to the folks on the ground. I'm still seeing stories about different nurses not having N95 masks and whatnot. So, again, if people don't know it's there, that sounds like a problem. Continue, sir. But now, uh, I spoke yesterday with the President of Mexico and with various other countries. We're going to be helping them with ventilators. We have tremendous numbers of ventilators. Uh, in fact, I, I hear, I understand that uh, Governor Cuomo is going to be sending up to Massachusetts some of the excess ventilators that Thank you. Uh, we were able to get, and that's great. I think it's a great thing. The number of new hospital admissions is also significantly down. When you look at these numbers, it's a uh, so Good thing to see, other than... It, it, it does depend on the state. I believe Governor Baker said we should be seeing our our spike either this week or this upcoming week. So, continue, Mr. President. The fact that we also know how people have been just ravaged by this, by this curse, by this uh, horrible scourge, plague, call it. It's got many different names. In many of the hot spots, including a 50 percent decline over a nine-day period in New York City, that's a fantastic decline. Mm. It's a beautiful thing to see after going through the opposite. We continue to see improvement with declining trajectory of cases in Seattle, Detroit, New Orleans, Indianapolis, and Houston metro areas. More evidence that our aggressive strategy is working, and I thank 
the American people for their selfless devotion. The American people have done a hell of a job. We're uh, saving countless lives, though. And again, I'll say it because I always wanted to say, well, can you leave it open? Nobody ever heard of anything like this. Not since 1917, more than 100 years ago, has anything like this happened. And in those days, they had no real communication, so you couldn't say, go inside, don't, you know, people just died. Almost 100 million people, it's reported. It's uh, tough. So, you know, the American people, what they've done is, uh, is incredible. And they've learned a lot, you know? And you see people uh, picketing a little bit, and uh, they want to get out. They want to get out and get back with their lives, and that's good. But they have learned a lot. They've learned about distancing, even now, at least until this thing. Well, I mean, the president likely encouraged a lot of that. He did say liberate Michigan as well as, I believe, a few other states as well. I have seen some pictures, and at least from what I saw from those pictures, assuming they're correct, uh, not everyone appeared to be socially distancing, and that does seem to be a potential issue. I mean, hopefully, God bless, and everyone will be all right, but Mr. President, go on. Thing totally goes away. They've learned about their washing their hands and all of the different things that we've been talking about ad nauseum for so long. And uh, they get it. They get it. And some places the governors are ready to go, and other places they can't go yet, and they won't go. They want to. They have to have it safe. I want it to be safe too. It has to be safe. We're, we're hearing that uh, Texas and Vermont governors are going to slowly start reopening the states as of tomorrow, I believe. Mr. President. And again, I, I have to say this. I can't emphasize it strongly enough. Uh, I'm probably going to show you charts of some of the countries that are really having trouble. And uh, one in particular is having a massive problem where they said, let's go. We're just going to keep going. Well, they're the lines that you're, we're famous for now. Some are flat and some are up. Uh, this is like a rocket ship. This country is uh, — and they didn't — they decided Let's go and let's wing it. It's, uh, you know, they thought it was okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And there's another couple, there's one in particular that everybody thinks did it, but the people are staying in. Okay, you know, not, uh, the head of a country doesn't have to say stay in. These people are smart people. They know what's going on. They see what's going on. So they don't have to say, they can say they're not doing that, but the people are staying inside. There are not a lot of people outside sitting at cafes, uh, despite what the mode of a country is. But if you look at Europe, most countries have done this. A couple tried not to. Italy tried not to, and they held it. And uh, Spain tried not to. They went that way. France tried not to. I mean, nobody wants to do this. It's a, it's a brutal step. We're going to close down your country. Who ever heard of a thing like this? But we would have had millions of people die if we didn't do this. Millions of people. And I believe that, Mike. I think, you know, in looking at things that we've been looking at over the last couple of days, I think and, — and really over the last couple of weeks, from the time we did it, shortly thereafter, I said we made the right decision in closing down, made the right decision on borders, uh, banning people coming in from China, banning ultimately people coming in from Europe. Uh, but we would have had millions of deaths instead of it looks like we'll be at about a 60,000 mark, which is 40,000 less than the lowest number thought of. So this isn't a case where people would say, oh, we would have had that number. It's similar to a flu. It's not the same thing as a flu at all, because if we wouldn't have done anything, you would have had — so a flu would have 35. It goes from 27 to 35, 40, 50 sometimes. It's over a long period of time, much different. It's even a much different death. To be honest, it's a much different death. This is violent. CMS is finalizing new guidelines for doctors and patients to resume elective surgeries. It's a big thing. A lot of hospitals were closed. They couldn't do any elective surgeries. They'll be able to start doing that. Procedures and medical care that needs to be done in person. As long as the rate of infections remains low in a community, we want patients to be able to go to their doctors, get clinically tested, and uh, have work done, surgeries, receive treatment for chronic conditions, and resume preventative care. So we'll be allowing that to happen very soon. Uh, we had no capacity in the hospitals with what happened with the uh, 
with the plague. We had no capacity to do it. If your doctor believes you need a treatment in person, you can get a treatment now. You can and should get a treatment now. We. So what do you do if your primary care physician is literally closed until further notice? Continue, sir. You're asking that healthcare facilities have plans in place to keep patients safe during their visits. Some places like New York, New Jersey, where they really got hit hard, uh, it's going to be a little bit tougher. They've done a great job, but they really were a, a center. I mean, they were a center. I was watching that. It was incredible. But now they're, they're leveling off, and I think they'll be coming down very soon. Uh, Administrator Seema Verma will be telling you a little bit more about it. Mike's going to say a few words. Seema will then speak, tell you a little bit more about that. My administration continues to execute our massive military operation to supply our hospitals with equipment they need and beds if necessary. But it looks like we're totally covered on beds. We have uh, plenty of beds. It's highly unlikely. That would be bad news if we needed more beds, but it looks like it's going just the opposite direction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Governor Cuomo, the relationship there do it for this whole thing. We're, we're building hospitals. It was very good. We built a little bit more than we needed, and that's good, as opposed to building a little bit less. That's not good. But uh, he's worked very well with us. The governor of Louisiana has been great on the bed, on that whole situation with the beds. Uh, frankly, uh, the governor of Michigan was very good with us on on uh, beds. You know, it's a very complex subject. You need buildings, or you have to do tents, or you have to do a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. But the Army Corps of Engineers was fantastic. They were fantastic. The, the Army Corps is absolutely amazing. They have converted over, I believe, what was it, the Javits Center in uh, New York, uh, basically over into a hospital as well as they set up a number of field hospitals. Uh, basically those appear to be like those tent-like structures and stuff out there uh, just for additional capacity if need be. And it sounds like we haven't really had to use all that additional capacity and thank God for that. Continue, sir. Uh, Florida likewise, Governor DeSantis. Uh, and I could name probably uh, six other locations I'll tell you one, uh, California was fantastic. He was really good. He was really good. And I appreciate the fact that he, he said what he wanted to say, and he wasn't letting the, the press force him into saying something that he didn't want to say. So I appreciate it very much, Governor of California. Uh, he really uh, he worked very hard. We worked together. He worked very hard. The federal government is currently Procuring more than 100,000 ventilators through new production or purchases with thousands already delivered. We've delivered thousands of brand new ventilators all throughout the country. New York would be, I guess, the biggest uh, user. And uh, they are now taking some of their excess ventilators, which is great, and they're sending them up to Massachusetts. I think it's 400. And uh, that's, that's a great thing. Our total supply of ventilators continues to exceed by a lot total expected demand. Uh, Governor Cuomo said today that uh, no one who needed a ventilator was denied a ventilator. That's a beautiful statement. I appreciate it. And uh, all governors are in that same position. Uh, we do have a clip that I thought would be appropriate to put up today. Um, it's, it'll take two minutes, and I think you'll find it interesting, but we appreciate it. And let's see if we can do that. You'll turn out the lights, and we'll see if we can do that. Thank you. All right. What do we have? The volume is very low. Phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, we bent the curve. We flattened the curve. Government did it. People did it. But government facilitates people's actions, right? Uh, we had to double the ho hospital capacity in New York State. Uh, that's what all the experts said. Uh, President brought in the Army Corps of Engineers. They built uh, 2,500 beds at Javits that uh, Michael and Northwell were operating. It was a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, close to a thousand people have gone through Javits. Luckily, we didn't need the 2,500 beds, but all the projections said we did need it, and more, by the way. Uh, so it, it, these were just extraordinary 
efforts and acts of mobilization. And uh, the federal government stepped up and was a great partner. And I'm the first one to say it. Uh, we needed help and they were there. State and local governments were fantastic. The hospital system was fantastic. Fantastic. New Yorkers were fantastic. And that is an undeniable fact. Just to look at what they said was going to happen. CDC, Coronavirus Task Force, Cornell, McKinsey, all of them. And they had a line up here. And the actual line is down here. What do you owe the variants to? Heroic efforts on behalf of people as facilitated by government, federal and state. It's New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo. Actually had something else. Are they finished with that? Sounds like the president was they expecting a little more. Part. Oh. Great, great job, fellas. They did a better job on ventilators. No. Andrew had something else to say that was really nice, but we won't go through that. Uh, but he really, I mean, it was really uh, a good statement. Do you want to put the rest of it up, or do you not have it? I just think it's so good because it's bipartisan. You know, this is not about Democrats, Republicans. This is about a thing that hit our country, the likes of which has never happened to us before. Wars, those, those wars, civil war, sure. But the First World War, the second World War, they're not fought on this country. This is being fought in this country, but it's being fought in 184 countries all over the world. It's terrible. But I want to thank Andrew, Governor Cuomo, for the uh, statement. He actually, if you go a little bit further, it was uh, it was even uh, far beyond even that. So it was good. Do you remember? Huh? Well, that's okay. Whatever. But it's. Uh, it's he said some really good things and and that's it. it it makes people feel good it's actually the wall street journal uh, christopher was saying i want to make people feel good too i want to make when they're doing a good job i want to make people feel good i want the admiral to feel good he's worked so hard mike has worked so hard and uh it was it was very nice it was on this morning it was all it was andrew this morning it's uh, it's a little uh, uh, longer clip than that. But you'll see, it was really a, a very nice thing that he said. And people really appreciate that, because they've done a great job. The federal government's done a great job, I mean, we, with all of it. And this is easy. The, uh, the swabs are — that's easy. We have them coming by the tens of millions. We have them coming at a level that you'll have so many swabs, you won't know what to do with them. That's easy. Uh, so uh, they'll all — they'll all be there. They're, a lot of them are there already. Uh, they're learning about their testing capacity that they didn't know about that uh, that we have in the various labs, including academic. They have to remember, you have a lot of these big colleges that have labs that are totally ready to help. But I want to thank the uh, Dynamic Ventilator Reserve, because uh, what they've done is incredible. It's a capital DVR, by the way, an innovative public-private partnership. That's what we created. We're gaining access to up to 65,000 additional ventilators in hospitals across the nation that can be redeployed very quickly to areas with the greatest need when they're not in use. And we right now have almost 10,000 in our reserve. We've been able to give away thousands, like we helped Andrew or we helped uh, Phil in New Jersey. He's doing a great job. Andrew would tell you that, too. They have a very good relationship working together and working with us. Uh, but we have uh, — now we're back up to almost 10,000, and this is after giving away thou tens of thousands of ventilators. And we're going to fill up the reserves of states. We're going to work with them, so in case this happens again. Uh, but we're also going to help other countries. I was telling you, the President of Mexico, we're going to be sending uh, a pretty large quantity to Mexico. They very much need them, and to other countries where they need them. Uh, we've had — I've had about six calls with leaders of other countries, and they need them. They're hard to — they're hard to get done. We did — our companies stepped up, and they did an incredible job. Some of them were automobile companies, and they take an assembly line, and they'd say, guess what? We're making ventilators now for a while. But because of the historic steps that we've taken, uh, I remain confident that every American who needs any of this equipment, any of the things we're talking about, 
uh, we'll either have it now, already has it, or we'll shortly have it. Through the Project Airbridge, we've completed 64 flights carrying over 600 million pieces of personal protective equipment, such as gloves, gowns, and other medical gear, with 50 more flights scheduled in the very near future. The team doing that is an incredible team of military people and young geniuses. It, it is incredible, those uh, three gigantic planes provided by Boeing. Uh, up here, we had Bob Kraft and the Patriots help do some flights themselves. So thank you, Mr. Kraft and all members of the Patriots franchise. Continue, sir. Some are older geniuses, but mostly younger geniuses, I think I can say. Some are people that made vast amounts of money in Silicon Valley. And, you know, these are very smart people. The job they've done is incredible. And I said, where do you come from? Well, I sold my company, sir. Oh, really? How much did you get? I think he said $700 million. I said, that's good. You want to work for the government? No, I want to help our country, sir. And it's tremendous brain power. It's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, young, incredible people that love this country, and they worked with the military. Admiral, you would say they were pretty smart, right? Yes, sir. They were in the upper scales of IQ. Yes, they were the upper. They were the, they were the top scale, I'll tell you. And they're great people. But FEMA is working to commit another $384 million to produce another 64 million gowns for health care. These are the highest quality, where they're very safe. When you put them on, they're safe. Uh, very important. The quality of the gown is very important. It's people in different places, different countries. They you, you also want to make sure you're utilizing it properly. For instance, with a mask, you want to make sure your mouth and nose are covered. And somebody like me, who has a big brushy beard, that really isn't the greatest thing. So it's one of the reasons it's probably going soon. So continue, sir. They're wearing gowns with cuts in them, and these are very safe. I want to thank America's textile manufacturers for their partnership in this remarkable undertaking. Two U.S. companies, Haynes and Standard Textile, are on track to produce 5 million gowns by the end of the month. And that's really moving. That's really moving. Uh, two great companies, you know the companies. Another great American company, Honeywell, recently began manufacturing N95 masks in Rhode Island where they converted a factory in less than five weeks instead of the nine months it was normally expected to take. So they've already done it, and they did it so rapidly. Five weeks instead of nine months. It's amazing, the spirit of this country. It's really about the spirit of the country. We said, do it, do it fast. But they did it in uh, — and this is — this was a major conversion, too. This is a different world. Honeywell is hiring more than 1,000 American workers to produce 20 million masks per month. 20 million masks a month. Thanks to the Defense Production Act, we'll be receiving another 40 million masks over the next few weeks. And uh, I also want to thank 3M, because they really stepped up. We had a little dispute at the beginning, but that got worked out quickly, and they've been doing a great job, 3M. They really have been. I want to thank they're a great CEO. We, uh, we had a little skirmish, but it worked out well. And they're doing a lot of work right now on masks and other things. This production is in addition to the 55 million N95 masks my administration has already distributed. Plus, we ordered, and it's coming in soon, 500 million masks. You would think, what are you going to do with them? They get used rapidly. Right. Uh, in addition to that, as you know, we sterilize masks now. Great company in Ohio. Yeah, be, be, because from what I've been being told, and again, I am not a doctor nor medical professional in any regards, um, basically you need to use a new one for each patient and everything. And that's, if you're seeing dozens and dozens of patients a day, one healthcare worker themselves can easily go through a number of those. So continue, Mr. President. Recommended by the governor of Ohio strongly. And it's doing very well, and they're sterilizing. A lot of the masks can be sterilized up to 20 times, so that's like buying 20 masks. And I always wondered, why aren't they sterilizing these masks? They're pretty — some of them are pretty sophisticated masks, and some you can't because of the material. Others you can. But uh, we have uh, actually two companies that do this, but one company I know very well in Ohio, and they're doing a great job. So they're sterilizing masks up to 20 times you can sterilize a certain type of mask. To these numbers in perspective, 
And to put them into perspective, American healthcare providers use an estimated 25 million N95 masks nationwide in a typical year. So a typical year, 25 million. That means we've secured nearly four times as many N95 masks in recent weeks as we would in entire healthcare industry during a typical year. Over a matter of a couple of weeks, we had more masks than we would do in a year. Think of that, over a couple of weeks. Moreover, we're bringing supply chains back home, and we've learned a lot about supply chains. We've learned uh, that it's nice to make things in the U.S. I've been saying that for a long time. One of the reasons I ran for office, because we started making things everywhere but here. And if one thing comes out of this, more than anything else, it's that we should make product in the United States. And these supply chains, they sound wonderful. But if one country has a problem, the whole chain is ruined. And I've been saying it for a long time. I ran partially on that. I we, we, we do have a lot of uh, just-in-time uh, supply chains. Basically, that's something, at least when I was studying business in school, uh, basically what you do is you don't want to be holding inventory because you got to store it. And then if it's not actually being sold and processed, I mean, that is an additional cost to business. However, if you do have an interruption there, that can cause very major issues. Continue, sir. I ran partially on that. I ran on that, and I ran very strongly against China. And then we made a great trade deal where they buy $250 billion. They're supposed to. And uh, they're paying tariffs. They paid us tens of billions of dollars. I've given $12 billion one year, $16 billion another year, and $19 billion to our farmers and ranchers who were targeted. But, uh, you know, I ran on China and other countries, the way they were ripping us off. They were ripping off our country. And China understood that. I mean, China fully understood that. And uh, they're, they're big, strong, smart people. And uh, I wasn't friendly, and it wasn't a friendly situation. And we ended up making an incredible deal with China for tens of billions of dollars of product, 40 to $50 billion to the farmers. The most they ever spent was 15 to 16. Now they're supposed to spend 40 to 50. Now, of course, the, uh, the virus came along, and I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I let them know I'm not happy. So, you know, we had a great relationship with — we had a very bad relationship with China. Then we had a good relationship, because we made a great deal. But we're not happy. This is not a good thing that happened came out of China, so we're not — we're not in a position where uh, we're going to say much yet, but uh, the deal itself — That uh, that right there is something that just I, — I do wonder, because even yesterday in his uh, press conference, the president said that he would explain someday. There's, there's information that we don't seem to have right now, and I'm curious about what that may be. Continue, Mr. President. Self is great. The deal is it's going to put many, many people to work in our country, but uh, all of that has to be taken into account when you look at all of the people that are dying in our country, but all over the world. All over the world, people are dying. I had a G7 call, and their economies are in tatters. They're shattered, the G7 countries. You have Japan and Germany and France. And the different countries, uh, Italy, look at what happened to Italy. Look at what happened to these countries. Look at what happened to Spain. Look what happened to Spain, how, how incredible. It's just been shattered. And so many other countries are shattered. So nobody ever thought this could have happened, a thing like this. It's very, very sad. But if we've learned something, it's about supply chains. I, I just saw yesterday where when the auto industry gets back, they have a problem because there's a, a supply chain going through a different country. And this has been going on for years, for decades. I, I always said it was no good. Why do, why do we make it? Why do you need a supply chain? Make — very simple. Make your parts here. They get one part from this country, one part from that country. It's all over. Uh, I think a lot of this comes down to fiduciary duty. Sorry to cut you off, Mr. President. but. Uh, this is something I believe even Brett Weinstein uh, touched upon during his Dark Horse podcast the other day. It's just, 
if you are a corporate officer and you are a part of a publicly traded company and you have a fiduciary duty to maximize that value to your shareholders, if you're producing something here and it costs you $10 and you can have it manufactured shipped somewhere else and it costs you two bucks, what do you do? If you're trying to maximize your return, that's why we see a lot of jobs going overseas over the past 20 years or so. So continue, sir. Over the place. The problem is if one country has a problem, you have no car or whatever it is you're making. So we've learned uh, a good lesson. I think a lot of smart people knew that before. But we've uh, distributed many hundreds of millions of masks. This pandemic has underscored the vital importance of reshoring our supply chains and bringing them back into the United States, where they belong, where they should have never left. What happens if you're in a war and you have a supply chain where half of your supplies are given to you by other countries? Who are, who are the people that thought of this? These are globalists. It doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work during rough times, bad times, or dangerous times. So we're going to continue to fight the virus. We're talking to China. We spoke to them a long time ago about going in. We want to go in. We want to see what's going on. And uh, we weren't exactly invited, I can tell you that. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the investigations that are going on in terms of uh, World Health Organization, and I'll, I'll take it a step further. World Trade Organization, too. World Trade. We, we did years ago, years ago, many years ago, the World Trade Organization, from the day China came in, that's when China bloomed. They were mainlining it, and then, boom, they were up like a rocket ship because they took advantage of every little ridiculous clause in the World Trade Organization documents. I, I believe somebody may have... Uh who may have utilized certain uh, regulations or stipulations may have once said that makes them smart. Continue. They were a developing nation. China was a developing nation. They make the cars, they make the plan, they make everything, they make everything. And they're a developing nation. So we've had a, I might have gotten elected to a certain extent because of China and other countries. One of my big things was trade. The United States is getting ripped off in trade. Now Japan is paying $40 billion and buying a lot. That's before we even do the deal. U.S.-Mexico was a great deal. The NAFTA was one of the worst deals ever made in trade, in trade history. And uh, I would also put the World Trade Organization in that same group. So I was very tough on these countries. With China, we made the deal, and we became friendly. But then this happened, and this is uh, — this is tantamount. This is something that's really incredible. I do want to read the, the something that I just saw today on television. I was looking, and I just said, uh, that's an interesting statement. Uh, we talk about uh, the Democrats, and it was a statement made by Brett Baer, good guy, smart. On February 19th, there was a Democratic debate in Las Vegas. That was February 19th. That's way after I closed entrance from China 20th of into January. our country. So, Brett goes, on February 19th, there was a Democratic debate in Las Vegas. Three words weren't said during the debate. Virus, coronavirus, or COVID-19. Those three words never came up. That was, uh, I just thought it was a very interesting, because, you know, you hear these People, some of the people, the Democrats said, oh, this, that. It never even was a part of their dialogue. We must remember, nobody would ever make anything political. Now they bring it up because you see what happened so now, but they didn't bring it up. But I brought it up. I brought it up a long time before I made the trade deal, and uh, I was not easy to deal with. I was not easy to deal with. They understand that. We still have 25 percent on $250 billion that they have to pay us. And uh, it's a lot of money. We've taken in a lot of money, and we've had a lot of beneficiaries, including our farmers and ranchers. So in addition, we've launched an unprecedented effort to develop new treatments and therapies to battle the plague. Uh, therapies, to me, are the most exciting. The, the 
Vaccines are obviously so important, but the therapies are immediate, you know. And we have some things that are really looking good, really looking good. We call COVID Treatment Acceleration Program. We're accelerating all of these great companies that are looking. And we have government agencies looking, too, NIH. This extraordinary program is slashing red tape to speed and development anti-rival. And, and if you look at, if you look at uh, what we're doing in terms of the speed, it's unrivaled. It's totally unrivaled. There's never been anything like it. The FDA and Dr. Stephen Hahn, a highly respected man from a great institution, left that job to come here. Uh, the job he's doing is incredible. And we're working with Scott, his predecessor is terrific. We're working with a lot of people, but uh, the speed of development for antiviral, antibody, and immune therapies is uh, at a level that nobody thought even possible. And I will say this, we're getting very good results. It's a little soon yet. But if we could find the therapies that would solve the problem, if somebody has a problem, we can get it taken care of so it's not so devastating as it has been. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Vice President Pence to come up. And I have to say it's a Sunday, a Sunday evening, uh, and uh, this man has not stopped. He's uh, working — we all are, in all fairness — but he's been working with his task force and everyone else around the clock for months. And I just want to thank Mike. Thank you, Mike. All right. As we see there, the President has handed off to Vice President Pence there. Uh, the president spoke for probably upwards of about 40 minutes or so. Um, touched upon a number of different things. He reiterated the uh, nation's use of the D Defense Production Act as need be, as well as uh, the deployment of a number of supplies. Um, again, my concern is, are these getting to the actual people on the ground themselves? Because he even highlighted some of these states and or the officials that were in charge didn't know where they were or how to use some of these devices. Now, who, who is that on? Was it not explained to them? Was it not provided to them? Where is the breakdown so we can make sure that this never happens again, so we can maximize our response to, as the President said right there, a plague? I don't know. We're going to have to uh, wait and find out, but hey, Thank you all for watching. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and long live the elbow bump. Oop. Hey.